my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin, the people sing, the people sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a near revival stirring as we pray and see we're on our knees, we're on our knees. Hosanna in the highest Hosanna 
my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing Heal my heart and make it clean Open up my eyes to the things unseen Show me how to love like you have loved me Break my heart for what breaks yours Everything I am for your kingdom's cause As I walk from earth into eternity Let's sing Hosanna Hosanna Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Hey Westwood family, I'm Emily Hansen. This is my husband Nolan. Um, he's been attending Westwood for essentially his entire life. Um, I've been attending Westwood for about four years and we just wanted to welcome you to our online service. Something we really value here at Westwood is our life groups. And Emily and I have been really uh, privileged and blessed to be in the life group that we have. Um, despite the challenges and having to meet virtually, it's just been really amazing to be able to dive into the Word together and to spend time intentionally praying for one another. Uh, today, Pastor Ryan will be speaking on that very subject, and afterwards will be actually followed by a, a week of prayer. And so there'll be more details about that uh, after the sermon. If you're someone who's looking to get connected into a life group, please check out our website. Um, let me pray for us and, and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you so much um, for every person that is uh, behind the other side of this screen, Lord. We thank you for who they are and we just pray that you would just prepare their hearts as we enter into a time of worship together. In your holy name, Jesus, amen. Hey church, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Why don't you join us as we sing? We're going to encounter God together today. i 
like to introduce a new song to you guys this morning. And um, it's not a brand new song. It's been around for a few years, and so it might be familiar to some of you. It's called I Will Exalt You by Hillsong. And I love the simplicity of it. It's really just exalting God over and over again. And sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need repetition um, in order to to really get in a space of exalting the Lord. Um, And so I just want to point us to the scripture that um, could have inspired it. Um, Obviously, exaltation of God is everywhere in the Bible. But I believe that this is uh, very pertinent. So it's out of Isaiah 25. And there's a few verses that I just want to pick out for us this morning. Starting in verse 1, it says this. O Lord, I will honor and praise your name, for you are my God. You do such wonderful things. You planned them long ago, and now you have accomplished them. Down to verse 4, it says, But you are a tower of refuge to the poor, O Lord, a tower of refuge to the needy in distress. You are a refuge from the storm and a shelter from the heat. I just want us to sing this song. If it needs to be a prayer for you, I just invite you to take that posture. Let's just choose uh, to spend these next moments together with our eyes fixed on Jesus.
Good morning, everyone. This morning we are continuing our series in the book of Acts, and we're going to be hanging out this morning in Acts chapter 12, uh, where we're going to be dealing with the topic of prayer. Now, I don't know exactly what your experience is uh, with prayer, but when it comes to prayer, uh, you've, you've made, if you've prayed very much, you've probably had times uh, where you've prayed and you've gotten the answer that you desired, and you're so excited and, and, and happy and praising the Lord. And, and if you've, you may also have experienced a time when you've prayed and prayed, and maybe you've prayed for a long time about something, just desperately asking God for something, and never really got the results um, that you were hoping for. And so we want to kind of uh, work through a little bit of that this morning. But as we do that, I want to just start off uh, by telling a story uh, about a, a good friend of mine, from my time in Kenya. Uh, his name uh, is Philip, and Philip uh, was very much a man of prayer and very much a man of faith. But uh, as I was mentioning earlier, he'd had moments where God had, had uh, shown up in just supernatural, miraculous ways, and he'd had other moments where he'd prayed for things and, and didn't get um, the answer he was longing for or hoping for. A and so one time, he, he had, like, his role was that he had he was running a child rehabilitation center for kids who were coming off the street from, with glue addiction. So street kids that had glue addiction, he would bring them off the street and he would rehabilitate them. And some of them would, went on uh, to be doctors. Some of them worked in the UN. It was like a highly successful thing he did. And he had about 60 boys, usually in the ages 
of 12 to 18. He'd try to get them when they were younger and then raise them up through high school and get them an education and kind of launch them into life. And one day he, he was there at the center. It was called Stars for Jesus. And he was there and, and they were just like right out of food. He had no idea how he was going to feed these 60 kids. It was a desperate situation. And so he said, okay, boys, this is what we're going to do. We are going to just gather together in the, in the main dining hall, and we're just going to pray and pray and pray, and we're going to hope that God shows up and somehow he's going to provide food for us. So they all gathered in there, and they were praying, and they're praying, they're fervently praying, just crying out to God that somehow he's going to provide them uh, a meal that night. And, and Philip told me when he tells the story, he, he, he often would tell me, I, I got to, to a point where I was like, okay, I know I needed to say amen, but I was afraid to say amen. So I prayed for longer because I was afraid to say amen because I was thinking like, what if I say amen and nothing happens? These boys would be so disappointed. So eventually he gets to the point where he's like, okay, I can't, I can't drag this on any longer. I need to say amen. And he says amen. And as soon as he says amen, he hears a knock at the door. And he goes and he answers the door. And when he answers the door, there's, this, there's th several men in chef outfits with chef hats. A and they say, they say yeah, uh, we just wanted to ask you, we, we were doing this catering event at, at the local college here, and it was supposed to be for all these pastors who were going to come from all around the country. And we just have so much food, and we don't know what to do with it. And we thought, just, since you were just down the street from us, uh, maybe you'd like to have it. And Philip's like, oh man, uh, yeah, actually, you, you'll never believe this. We were just praying that God would somehow miraculously provide us a meal tonight. And, and to which the chef answered, yeah, I know, we've been waiting for the last half an hour. And Philip says, well, why didn't you knock sooner? And he says, well, I didn't want to didn't interrupt the prayer service. And, and so God had actually already answered the, the prayer long before Philip had ever said amen. But Philip was nervous to say amen. Why? Because he'd had moments where God had shown up, but he'd also had moments where, where God didn't give him the answer. And so there was this little bit of like fear and doubt that's in there. And, and that's his story is similar to the story we're going to see today. That sometimes um, when we've prayed, especially if we've prayed for things in the past and we haven't got the answer we hoped, we're a little, we pray for something, but we're a little unsure if we're actually going to get the answer. We're not, we're not always praying in, in, in maybe the confidence that we'd, that we'd like or that we'd hope. And, and so when we think about prayer then, and, and we think about our experiences with prayer, whatever your experiences are, you've often asked, probably thought or maybe even asked out loud this question, does prayer work? Does it work? Like if I pray, is it going to make any difference at all? Like does it have any effect? Does prayer work? And often, if we're really, really honest and we were to dig a little bit deeper under this question of, does prayer work? What we're really saying is, if I pray, will I get my desired result? If I pray, will I get my desired result? And unfortunately, often then, prayer becomes about convincing God to give us what we want, rather than it being about desiring to see his will be done. And so prayer, prayer we, we, we can develop this mentality of, okay, I, I, I pray and then I should receive what I ask for. And it becomes, uh, prayer can become an exercise that is, is actually uh, fairly self-seeking. And, and I don't think that we often necessarily start out intending it to be so we just so desperately desire the thing that that we're praying for and some and often those things are even good that we're praying for but if we're not careful this is what it this is what it can become it, it becomes about convincing god to give us what we want and, and i think that prayer can be so much richer than that there, there's a yes we're, we're called to come to god and to lay our petitions our requests before him but if it's just about this and lacks this, I think, I, I worry we might be missing it. We might be missing the fullness and richness of prayer um, that, that's there for us. 
So then, why don't we go to the passage in Acts chapter 12 and have a look at the story and see kind of some of the things it points us to. And we're going to look at a few other passages as well. And, and we're going to wrestle with this whole idea of prayer. And what, what, what's the point? Does it work? And, and, and why do we do this? And, and what's it, this whole prayer thing all about? So Acts chapter 12, we're going to be uh, starting in verse 1. It says, it was time that King Herod, or sorry, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Okay, so it's important to note here that James, the brother of John, is actually one of the original apostles. You remember James and John, sometimes he is referred to them as the sons of thunder, like, like he's, an, he's an original apostle. So this is a big deal. And, and, and this is also a big deal because later on, when we go in the story, I want you just to keep this in your mind that James... James is executed, okay? He's put to death with the sword. And when he, when, he, when, when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to see Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So, quick recap. A bunch of people who are part of the church are arrested. James is executed. Herod sees that this pleases some of the Jews, and so he, he arrests Peter also. And so now, the church is fervently praying for Peter. They don't want him to meet the same demise that James did. And, and, and I would posit a, a, little, a little question here, a little caveat. I wonder, when James was arrested, I, I wonder if the church prayed for him. I kind of get the inclination they probably did. They probably pray, prayed for James. I can't imagine John who is so close to Jesus and sees Jesus' prayer life and his deep commitment to prayer, I can't see John, when his brother's arrested, not praying and calling the church to prayer. So I can't, I can't conclusively say this because the passage doesn't tell us one way or the other, but it just makes me wonder, like, like probably the church prayed for James. They didn't get the result they hoped. And so here they are now praying for Peter. At the very least, even if they didn't pray for John, James, James is in the back of their mind as they're crying out to God for Peter because they don't want Peter to have that same demise. So let's continue in the story. It says, so, so the, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. So he's heavily guarded and heavily chained. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. He said, get quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what that the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and then they went through it. And when they had walked the length of the street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. So Peter's miraculously set free by an angel. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So they're gathered together to pray for Peter. And Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door! To which, naturally, they responded, You're out of your mind! 
they, they, they don't believe you. They say, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. But when she kept insisting that it was so, then they said, it must be his angel. It's like they, they're fervently praying for Peter. God answers in a miraculous way, but because of maybe what, what was in their minds about what happened to James, they anticipated, they weren't anticipating getting the answer that they got to their prayer. And so even when their prayer has been answered, they, they doubt. They're uncertain that it's true. They, 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 they're having a hard time believing that what they were praying for and longing for has actually come to fruition. But Peter kept on knocking. Good thing he's persistent. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And then he left for another place. When I read this, it, it's just, it's so, their, their, their reaction, like, you, you can look at their reaction and go, like, come on, guys, like, you were praying for this, and then it happened, like, wh what's all the doubt about? But then when I think about my own life, like, uh, I'm an optimist and I have a lot of faith, and so when I pray for something, I absolutely believe that God is going to show up and do it. But I've also had times where I've prayed, sometimes for a long time, maybe even months about something, and not gotten the answer that I was looking for. And I have to admit, as I, as I would continue to press in with prayer, the longer that it went without answering, the less convinced I became that the prayer was ever going to be answered. I think this is, this is normal human nature. It gets, you know, when we've seen our prayers not answered in the way that we would have hoped, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to begin to doubt whether or not we'll actually see the answer. And maybe you've even experienced something like this where you've prayed for something for so long or, or, so, or so earnestly like they did that when it happens, it's like you're almost in disbelief that it could be true. And so The, the thing when I read this passage that, that always kind of comes into my mind, and maybe you're thinking it too, is why? Why? Why James? He's executed. He, he doesn't get this miraculous rescue. Well, Peter, they pray for him, and he does. Why sometimes do we see God show up in miraculous ways in answer to our prayers, and other times... We don't. Why, Peter? And you can speculate. I mean, you could, you could spend all kinds of time speculating about why Peter was saved and why James wasn't. You could be like, oh, well, of course Peter was saved because Jesus said that he was the rock he was going to build his church on, and, and Peter had all this missional things that he had to do. And you can, you can come up with all these kind of rational thoughts about, oh, well, that makes sense then that Peter was saved. But you don't think James had anything to offer? He was an apostle of Jesus that spent the same amount of time as Peter. You don't think he had anything to offer? So then, why is this? Why, why sometimes we get an answer that, a, a, that we would think would be in line with God and who he is? Like, you don't think that God cared about James? That God didn't want to see him live a good, long, abundant life? Like, what's going on here? Well, I think it's important then to think about how did Jesus pray? Like when Jesus was asked by his, his disciples, teach us how to pray, there's something really interesting very early on in his prayer that he says. When he's speaking to God, the Father, he says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here, here's an interesting thing. First of all, Jesus wants God's kingdom to come, and he wants his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, which would lead me to believe, if we need to pray this, that currently the fullness of God's will isn't being done on earth as it is in heaven. Otherwise, why would Jesus tell us to pray for that? And, and, and when we think, if we, if we know the, the whole narrative of, of Scripture, 
we know that Jesus is coming back to eventually make all things right again so that there won't be any more death, there won't be any more pain, there won't, there won't be any more of these, these kinds of things. There won't be, we won't be dealing with evil in the world anymore. He's going to make all things right again. That's the fullness. That is when we will fully realize the answer to this prayer of His will being done on earth as it is in heaven. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we aren't experiencing his kingdom coming in all of its fullness on earth. And so that's something to keep in mind as we wrestle with this. The second thing that we need to remember, and we see this in Ephesians 6, is Ephesians 6 reminds us that there is a spiritual battle going on here. In this broken world, where we chose to rebel and disobey God as human beings, in this broken world, there's this constant spiritual battle going on. And and we're reminded by Paul that it's against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, sometimes in life, in this broken world, bad things happen. Evil sometimes seems to prevail in certain situations. And this is what I want us to hear, is that sometimes, sometimes the kingdom of God seems, seems to win a battle. But take heart, because the kingdom of light, God's kingdom, has already won the war. Why? How? The kingdom of light has already won the war because Jesus came, lived on earth, died for us, and then rose again, conquering and defeating death and evil forever and will one day come back and make things whole again, make things the way that they were originally intended to be when God created the earth and said it is good, and he said people are very good probably not hard for you to think of examples in our current world of how the world isn't good and how people aren't always very good. So there's this battle. There's this battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, between evil and good. And sometimes, sometimes in this earth, it seems that darkness is winning. It seems like darkness is winning a battle. But take heart because the kingdom of light has already won the war. And, and even now in this earth, sometimes we get a little taste of heaven. We get a little taste of the kingdom. In a broken world, we get taste of the kingdom. But we don't get to experience it in its fullness yet. We're not there yet. We get moments where we see God do something miraculous in answer to our prayers. We get moments where we see God's light and love in real, tangible ways. But we're not experiencing it in its fullness like we will in the age to come. See, this is what I think. In in, in Revelation, it talks about our prayers being incense before God. It talks about our prayers having an aroma. And, And when I think about taste and aroma... You know, like, have you ever, have you ever been in a room, or maybe you've come home, and someone is cooking something really, really delicious, and that smell, it just, like, it makes your mouth water, and you just, like, you look so much forward to eating it. For me, Amanda makes this really awesome dish that I love called butter chicken lasagna, and oh my goodness, the smell. If I, when I smell butter chicken lasagna, I just, I get excited. I'm, I am like looking forward to eating that because the smell, the smell, it tips us off to this idea that we're about to taste something awesome, something good. And, and I wonder if, if part of the purpose of prayer is that it's, a, it's an aroma that helps us know when we are getting a taste of the kingdom. Think about this. Think about this for a moment. If my friend Philip, if he had never desperately prayed 
that God would miraculously feed them that night. Do you think when those chefs showed up, do you think he would have recognized fully that he was getting not just a taste of delicious food prepared by gourmet chefs, but that he was actually getting a taste of the kingdom? Do you think he would have recognized that? There's something about when we pray for something and then see God give us a taste of his kingdom, we recognize it as such. And we, we recognize that God has just given us a, a special gift, that he has just given us a glimpse of his kingdom. And that, yes, we don't experience that kingdom always in its fullness the way that we hope or long to. But he's just given us that, that taste. And so I feel like sometimes part of the purpose of prayer is to make us aware of when God is breaking through and with his kingdom in this world when we are experiencing a special taste of his kingdom. And if we don't pray, we will lack the awareness to know when God is doing something significant in our midst. We can easily write it off to, oh, that was just coincidence or that just, that just happened to be the case. Another story I could tell you. Um, when I lived on Vancouver Island, there was this ministry that, that they, they cared for people it was like a residential place where you could come with your family and, and you could go into detox from alcohol or, or from drugs. And they needed an extra house. And so they just started praying that God would somehow provide them an extra house. And lo and behold, after praying for a bit, a, a house literally floated up onto the shore of where their, their, their campus was that they did this. It, it literally floats up. And it, and it, was, it, it had become detached from a, from a logging uh, camp, or I can't remember if it was a logging camp or like a, a fishing, like an aquaculture place. I can't remember quite that detail, but I remember that it floated up, and so they, they realized that it was from one of these companies, and they called them, and they said, oh, just keep it. So they took this house, put it on a foundation, and that, to this day, that house is there. Amazing. But would they have recognized the amazing provision of God and that they were getting a taste of the kingdom if they hadn't prayed? Would they have recognized it as such? There's something powerful about prayer that awakens us to the will of God, that to, to, to awakens us to see that we have just seen the will of God happen on earth as it happens in heaven in that moment. And so prayer, it's important. It increases our faith. And it, and it makes us long in even greater measure for more tastes of the kingdom. See, tastes of the kingdom make us long for more tastes of the kingdom, both in the present, but also it makes us long for what we will experience in the life to come. And so in this broken world, we won't always see our prayers answered the way that we hoped or longed for. Sometimes because the prayer we're praying for maybe isn't in line with God's will, and sometimes because we just live in a broken world. And we get, we get moments where we get to taste the kingdom, but we don't always get to taste it in its fullness. But, but that should just cause us to desire and long to see it even more and to press into prayer even more so that we might get another taste of the kingdom and another taste of the kingdom. And, and it, it should give us hope and excitement that one day we'll get to experience that in its fullness. So I want to ask you this morning, then, in light of all this, what area of your life are you longing to have a taste of the kingdom in? What area of your life? Maybe, maybe you have someone close to you and they, they're having health issues. And you're longing to see a taste of the kingdom of, for God to come in and heal in that situation. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that's broken and you're longing to see some kind of reconciliation there. You're longing to see a taste of the kingdom to be able to walk in right relationship with that person again. What area of your life are you longing to have a taste of the kingdom in? I want to encourage you this morning to press in to prayer in that area. Ask God. The, the Greek word where in the passage where, where it's talking about 
how they prayed earnestly. It, it, it literally means to stretch out your hands, and it has this inclination that it means that you are, you are praying fervently. You're praying with all of your being, like you're stretching out your hands and desperately crying on God to do it. Would you do that this morning? And I want to encourage you this morning that we as a church, we want to pray with you. And so this morning, if you want prayer, we're going to put uh, a link in the chat and, and you can join a, a Zoom link. You can join that link and we're going to have people um, who could pray with you right now in this moment. And, and if you're not in a place where you're ready to do that now, I encourage you, email me, ryan at westwoodchurch.bc.ca, and I'd love to pray for you this week. I'd love to pray for you this week. But, but find ways that you can pray and that you can bring the church around you to pray, just as they were praying for Peter. It says the church. It doesn't say just Peter was praying. It says the church was praying. So gather the church around you to pray that you would get a taste of the kingdom in that area of your life that you're longing to see it take place. Let me pray for us this morning. Oh, Jesus, I thank you so much that you love to give us good gifts and that you love to give us a taste of your kingdom. You love for us to experience your kingdom here on earth, the way that we will one day experience it fully with you when in the new heaven and earth. And so, God, we, we long to see more and more of your kingdom breaking forth in our midst. And so, God, um, for people today who are longing to see a breakthrough in whatever area of their life, longing to see a taste of your kingdom in some area of their life, um, God, we, we say yes and amen, and we ask that they, that they would see it and God, I pray that you would give us perseverance in those moments of life where we're longing to see a taste of your kingdom and, and we're longing to see an answer to our prayer and we don't ever see the answer we hope for. Would you give us perseverance to keep trusting, to keep ho putting our hope that we will see your kingdom in its fullness, that we would keep walking in close communion with you, even in those moments where we, don't, where we don't see you show up the way that we would have liked or hoped, may you help us to continue to put our trust in you and to continue to press in earnestly in prayer, God, longing to see more of your kingdom. We pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
Stop. 